are you doing, Ed? Uh, setting up an instrument repair shop? Sort of, Tech. Bob asked me to explain how the thermal electric gauge and indicator light systems on our current models work so he can understand them better. All right, Bob, put those tank units down carefully so nothing will get bent. Tech's going to help me explain all about gauges and indicator lights, aren't you, Tech? Always ready to help, Ed. Uh, why don't you begin by telling Bob how the gauges work? Well, to properly explain thermal electric gauge operation, we'll have to cover a complete gauge circuit. The gauge, its sending unit, the voltage limiter, and circuit wiring. Now... Starting with fundamentals, our thermal electric gauges are operated by the heating effect of electric current. They all work on the same basic principle, only the dials are different. Why don't they use magnetic type gauges, like the ammeter? Because thermal type gauges are better for some systems. For example, they don't flicker like old style fuel gauges did when fuel sloshed around in the tank. Okay, but tell me more about that heating effect and how it makes the gauges work. Inside the gauge housing, there's a bimetal arm with a heating coil. This arm is linked to the gauge pointer so that arm movement causes the pointer to move when current flows through the heater winding. Here's what happens. When a small current flows through the coil, the heating effect on the bimetal arm is slight. This bends the arm only a small amount and gives a low reading. Then... With more current, the heating coil gets warmer and the bimetal arm deflects farther, moving the pointer across the gauge dial for a higher reading. And that's all there is to gauge operation. Any questions so far, Bob? Well, I know that bimetal bends or curls when it's heated, but I don't really understand why this happens. Bimetal bends because the two metals used expand at different rates when heated. You see, bimetal is two layers of different metals welded together to form a single piece. When a bimetal strip is heated, one layer tries to expand more than the other, but it's restrained because the two layers are welded together. So instead of expanding uniformly, the strip curves toward the low expansion side. As the strip cools, it again returns to its original shape. The bimetal parts used in other gauge and indicator light units operate the same way, Bob, so keep it in mind. Ed, you've told us that current heats a bimetal arm to move the gauge pointer. Now, tell us how this current is varied to give an accurate gauge indication. Okay, Tech. The indicating current in a gauge circuit is controlled by changing the resistance in the gauge's sending unit. Each type of sending unit is specially designed to vary its resistance as changes occur in its specific system. For example, when the fuel tank is filled, the high float moves the sender to the low resistance position. This increases indicating current and moves the gauge pointer to the full mark. When the tank is nearly empty, the low float moves to the high resistance position and the gauge pointer moves to empty. Now. I'll explain how the other types of gauge sending units work in more detail after I cover the voltage limiter, the remaining unit in our basic circuit explanation. Why do the gauges need a voltage limiter, Ed? Mostly for accuracy, Bob. If it weren't for the voltage limiter, normal changes in alternator output, battery condition, and electrical loads could cause false gauge indications. One other thing. Voltage limiter action also reduces the circuit voltage to protect the gauges. It's sort of a continuous duty circuit breaker that opens and closes to allow a part-time current flow. The heart of the voltage limiter is a bimetal arm with a heating coil similar to the one used in the gauge. But here, instead of moving a pointer, the arm opens and closes a set of contact points. Here's how it works. When the ignition switches on, input current flows through the contact points and the bimetal arm to supply all the gauges in the circuit. At the same time, some current also flows through the heating coil to ground. The current flowing through the coil heats the bimetal arm and causes the arm to bend. This bending movement opens the contacts and stops current flow through both the heating coil and the arm. When the heating coil cools, the bimetal arm straightens, closes the contacts, and begins the cycle once more. This cycling action produces a pulsating current flow, which, in effect, reduces the 12-volt input to 5 volts at the gauges. Now, 
You can see from this cycling action that the maximum heating effect of current flow to the gauge circuits depends basically on how long the voltage limiter contact points stay closed. So, the voltage limiter action maintains a steady heating effect by opening and closing its contacts faster as input voltage increases and slower as the voltage decreases. This compensates for the car's electrical system variations and keeps the gauge indications accurate. Just remember that the voltage limiter affects all the gauges in the circuit. If you find all the gauges are burnt out or act up the same way, chances are the troubles in the limiter or a poor limiter ground. Good points, Tech. Now, one final thing. Our voltage limiters may be externally mounted on the back of the cluster or built into one of the gauges depending on the car model. But more about that later. Are you ready to tackle sending unit details, Bob? Ready and waiting, Ed. What's first on the list? The fuel tank sending unit. You already know that float movement varies the resistance in the unit. So let's go on to mechanical details and see how these different tank units compare. I see that each of these fuel sending units has an intake tube and float arm that's different from the others. What's the reason for the various shapes and lengths? They're different because the senders are designed for different tank shapes and capacities. For example, the unit you're holding is used in the vertical tank of a station wagon. However, regardless of the mechanical differences, the variable resistance part of all our tank units is basically the same. A resistance strip connected to the gauge and a grounded moving contact attached to the float arm. You'll also notice that each tank unit has stops to keep the float from contacting the tank at empty and full positions. These stops also determine the resistance settings at the ends of the float travel range. Always be careful how you handle tank sending units. Just a little bump can bend the float arm or distort the stops. And either one will throw the resistance settings off and the gauge will indicate wrong. We'll talk about checking and installing tank units farther on. Right now, let's go on to the temperature sending units. The temperature sending unit is simply a sealed metal bulb containing a temperature sensitive resistor element. The sender is located in the cooling system where it can sense changes in coolant temperature. As the temperature sensitive element gets hot, the resistance decreases, causing the gauge pointer to rise. When the element cools, Resistance increases, and the gauge pointer moves toward the cool mark on the dial. That's sure an easy one. How about the oil pressure sender? The oil pressure sending unit has a built-in resistance strip and moving contact like the fuel tank sender. However, in this unit, the moving contact is operated by oil pressure. When the oil pressure is low, sender resistance is high. And when the pressure is high, the resistance is low. All right, Ed. You've covered gauges, sending units, and the voltage limiter. Now, why don't you do the same thing for indicator lights and switches? Coming right up, Tech. The oil pressure indicator light circuit is much simpler than the oil gauge circuit. All you have is an oil pressure switch and an indicator light, and with a light bulb instead of a gauge, there's no need for a voltage limiter. Now, with the ignition switch turned on, the indicator bulb lights when oil pressure is low or the engine's not running. This serves both to indicate low pressure and to proof test the bulb. Normally, the light goes out as soon as engine oil pressure opens the switch contacts. Next, we have the engine temperature indicator light system used on Chrysler models. The two lights, red and green, are connected to a temperature indicator switch which detects changes in coolant temperature. Temperature switch operation is simple. When the switch is cool, a bimetal arm in the switch bulb closes contacts in the green light circuit. The green bulb now lights when the ignition switch is turned on. As the coolant warms up, the bimetal arm breaks contact and both lights remain unlit over the normal temperature range. The arm closes the red light contacts only if the coolant overheats. Incidentally, the red bulb lights for proof testing when you turn the ignition switch to start position. And here's where someone had better turn the record so we can hear what's on the other side. 
Now, Ed, uh, suppose you explain the sentry signal used on the Imperial. Coming up, Tech. The sentry signal is actually a general alerting indicator that lights to warn the driver of low fuel level, low oil pressure, or overheating. Here's how it works. The sentry signal circuit includes a coolant temperature switch, oil pressure switch, and a low fuel level relay. These units all share a common connection to the sentry indicator light, so each can light the bulb. The signal switches work the same as in the single unit indicator systems, except that the green light terminal of the temperature switch is not used. The signal light is proof tested through the oil pressure switch when the ignition is switched on. The low fuel level relay lights the signal when the level gets down to one-eighth of a tankful. Can you explain how the relay detects the low fuel level, Ed? Sure can, Tech. Here's how the relay does it. First of all, the fuel relay is another thermal electric unit, generally similar to the voltage limiter. In this case, however, the bimetal arm holds the contact points open or closed instead of continually cycling, as in the limiter. Now. The heating coil that operates the signal contacts is connected in series with the tank sending unit. So when the float is high, the sending circuit current is high enough to make the bimetal arm bend. This holds the relay contacts open, and there's no warning signal from the tank circuit. As the fuel level drops, the current through the relay heating coil becomes low enough to let the bimetal arm cool. When the tank unit float nears the one-eighth tank position, the bimetal arm straightens out, the contacts close, and the signal light goes on. At the same time, the closed contacts allow signal light current to flow through a second heating coil on another part of the U-shaped bimetal arm. When this section bends, it holds the contacts firmly together until the ignition is switched off or fuel is added to the tank. What's the reason for the holding circuit, Ed? It keeps the signal light from flickering when fuel sloshes around in the nearly empty tank. Without the holding circuit, the tank center could cause the contacts to open and close as the float moved up and down. Okay, Ed. You've done a good job of explaining the gauge and indicator light circuits. Now, how about some troubleshooting information? Well, I always analyze the symptoms first to narrow down the probable cause of trouble. For example, voltage limiter trouble is easy to spot because it affects all the gauges at the same time. So, where all the gauge pointers move to full-scale position after the ignition switch is turned on, you'll usually find that the voltage limiter contacts are stuck closed or the heating coil is open. However, all pointers at full scale can also mean that a poor ground at the gauge cluster is causing erratic voltage limiter operation. If there's no limiter ground, it's the same as an open heating coil. Either an open heating circuit or stuck contacts can seriously damage all the gauges or burn them out. And another thing, before you work with tools behind the instrument panel, always disconnect the battery ground cable. An accidental short circuit can do costly damage to gauges, circuit boards, or other circuit parts. Right, Tech. And if a gauge cluster is rolled out of the panel, make sure that nothing is shorted before you reconnect the battery cable. Above all, don't forget to ground the gauge cluster with a jumper wire before you turn on the ignition, or you can burn out all the gauges. What causes erratic back-and-forth movement of all the gauge pointers, Ed? Like when the gauges read normal, and then suddenly all move to the right or left together. It could be loose connections, Bob, but where all the pointers temporarily move downscale from normal position, it's usually caused by dirty or burnt contacts in the voltage limiter. However, if the pointers all move upscale from steady positions, it means that a poor ground at the gauge cluster is causing the voltage limiter heating circuit to open temporarily. In some cases, you can fix a poor ground by simply tightening the cluster mounting screws. Of course, if there's no gauge pointer movement at all when the ignition is switched on, either the input to the voltage limiter or the limiter itself is open-circuited. If trouble symptoms point to the voltage limiter, it's always good practice to check the unit before replacing it.
especially if it's the built-in type used on some models. So, how do you test the limiter, Ed? Testing a voltage limiter on the car is easy. Simply connect a test light or voltmeter between the temperature sender terminal and ground with the sender wire connected. However, on current Chrysler models, the limiter connects only to the fuel gauge circuit, so you'll have to test it at the panel. Now, when the ignition switch is turned on, a flashing test light or fluctuating voltmeter tells you that the voltage limiter is working okay. A steady light or voltmeter reading indicates an inoperative limiter or a poor limiter ground. Be careful that you don't ground the sender terminal or wire when the ignition switch is on. Grounding any sender circuit allows higher than normal current flow, which can damage the gauge or burn it out. And here's something else to keep in mind. When you remove an external plug-in type voltage limiter, grasp the assembly firmly and pull straight out. Don't twist the limiter or try to pry it off of the screwdriver. You can break the circuit board or worse. Right. If the ignition switch is on and that screwdriver grounds the limiter input connector, you can burn out the circuit board. A short between the input and output connectors can burn out all the gauges, so be careful. Another thing, be careful with the voltage limiter that is built into one of the gauges. If you accidentally apply full battery voltage to the A or the S terminal, you'll burn out the gauge. Grounding the I terminal can burn out the circuit board. Any more tips on gauge diagnosis, Ed? Where only one gauge acts up, the voltage limiter is probably working properly, and you'll find the trouble in the gauge, the wiring, or the sending unit. For example, here's how you can track down fuel gauge trouble. First, connect a jumper wire between the sending unit housing and a good body ground. If the gauge now works properly, check the ground strap and the fuel line body clip for poor grounds. This is particularly important on older cars which have been exposed to road splash and corrosion. If further testing is needed, disconnect the sending unit wire and connect your thermal electric gauge tester to the sender wire and ground. And as Tech cautioned us earlier, don't ground the sender wire or you can burn out the gauge. Now, on Imperial models, the sending circuit total resistance includes the relay heating coil as well as the tank unit resistor. That means you must disconnect the indicator lead from the relay and connect it to the tester. Operate the tester and check the gauge indications against specs. If the gauge is still off, the sender or sender and relay are okay, and you'll have to continue your testing at the gauge terminal. Follow the instructions in your service manuals for testing the suspected gauge. If gauge indications are still incorrect, replace the gauge. Use this same process of elimination to diagnose temperature and oil pressure troubles. And that should wrap up testing. Now, how about a few pointers on handling and installing new fuel tank sending units? As you know, rough handling can bend the sending unit float arm or the stops and cause an inaccurate gauge indication. So before installing a new tank unit, it's good practice to check the sender resistance. This measurement must be precise, so be sure your ohmmeter is accurate. If the sender resistance is not within specs with the float arm held against the stops, you can adjust the stops slightly to get the correct resistance setting. Don't bend the stops open too far, or the sliding contact can run off the resistance strip and may jam or twist out of shape. Right, Tech. Now consider the car that runs out of fuel when the gauge still shows gas in the tank. Usually the sender resistance is okay, but you'll find the intake tube is bent upward, higher than normal. You see, the tank bottom may have been pushed in through carelessness or accident and then forced back out by air pressure. This fixes the dent, but leaves the sender's intake filter off the tank bottom, so it cannot pick up all the fuel. To avoid this problem, when installing a fuel tank sender, I always feel for the tank bottom with the intake tube filter. If it touches the bottom before I tighten the unit down, I know it will be in contact with the tank bottom when the unit is in place. <laughs>
And that wraps up this session on gauges. As usual, you'll find some extra servicing tips as well as all the things covered in this film in your reference book. So give it the cover to cover treatment. And remember, always follow the instructions in your service manuals. Don't play guessing games with expensive gauge equipment. See you next month.